All right, so welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin versus the banks. And I'm joined here by Ryan McLeod from, is it CNL? Yes, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. Awesome. And just judging by that name, uh, it kind of gives you some insight as to what this episode is primarily about. Uh, so this is the first one uh, that's going to dedicate itself to nuclear energy, something uh, I just mentioned to Ryan. I've been kind of going down the nuclear rabbit hole over the past six to eight months. Uh, it's it's really cool. It's Again, my, my perceptions around energy have changed so much over the past probably couple of years, actually. And I, I think nuclear is something that thankfully is, is sort of coming to the forefront. Uh, important light is being shed on it. Um, so yeah, why don't we start off, Ryan, by having you kind of introduce yourself and uh, tell us sort of what got you into Bitcoin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, you are definitely not alone in having taken a interest in nuclear power as of late. It's been attracting a lot more attention in the last two years or so. The uh, global conditions have definitely primed it for getting deserving that attention again with uh, yeah, renewables not really fulfilling on some of the promises and uh, goals of limiting and reducing the amount of hydrocarbons that we use in power production. So yeah, nuclear power is all the rage right now. And uh, so yeah, as I said, my, my name's Ryan McLeod on Twitter. I go by nuclear Bitcoin. I'm X now, whatever you want to call that, Noster. And then Orange Pill App, that's my general places where I can communicate through. I am a laboratory technologist that works at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. I've been working here for about nine years. Like I'm not anything fancy like an engineer or like uh, any of the, the scientists that get into like thermal hydraulics and all of the really complicated nitty gritty nuclear stuff. I, I run a few instruments in a laboratory that support a lot of the safety and research programs that are done at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, mostly around uh, material research in the hydrogen corrosion of the zirconium pressure tubes that we can do reactor for uses. So I keep the instruments maintained and operating. And while I do so, I also listen to podcasts frequently. And so early 2021, I started listening to Max Kaiser's podcast because he was a familiar touch point from when I had been listening to uh, various like uh, Ron Paul type uh, topics back in yeah when he was running for president and Max Kaiser would occasionally come up and you'd hear about Bitcoin. And yeah, for the most part, I just kind of got one on with my life like everyone else after just ignoring it for the first two, three times hearing about it. And then one time I cashed out from an online poker site and I just dropped that in a wallet, basically forgot about it until early 2021 when it was a much more substantial sum of money and caught my interest, number go up as most people do. And then I just went straight down the rabbit hole. My entire podcast lists went all orange pill, basically went from Max to to safety, to John Ballas, to Breed Love, and yeah, I could probably list off at least 20 of them now that I get through regularly. Now I have to be more discriminating with my time because, yeah, they start to add up after a while. There's a lot of them out there, but they all have different unique flares. Like everybody in this space is a really unique individual, like listening to Preston talk about something with Harry Sudok, you can get into different, different stuff than when he's talking with Peter McCormick. So if they every and there's so much going on and you don't want to miss it so and i have basically been in that rabbit hole for the last two week, two years and early on in my adventure i learned about bitcoin mining and how it was being applied to like off-grid applications like the gas flaring or hydroelectric dams that had excess generation and then being in the nuclear industry i was getting a pretty pretty good perspective of the new technologies that are being worked on and the state of the industry, at least for, for the most part in Canada. I didn't really pay too much attention to the global industry until I started to really dive more into the nuclear advocacy rabbit hole. And that's just as wide and far reaching as the Bitcoin one and has several more decades of history behind it. But uh, we'll, we'll get to some of that later. And uh, yeah, it was a conversation with my wife around time that Elon Musk had complained about the sources of energy that are predominantly used for Bitcoin mining and that tanked the price and then she started to ask questions and she she, she was more familiar with Bitcoin mining at that time. She was like, well, if that's such a problem, why don't we do it with nuclear power? And she said it in such a way that it was just like, well, if, if what you're telling me is correct, that just makes sense. Like, what? why aren't we doing this already? And then I, like, having paid attention to the spaces. 
there wasn't that much attention being paid to nuclear power at the time. Any time that nuclear power was being brought up, it was in relation to uh, plants being shut down, like Indian Point had recently been shut down in early 2021. Uh, the Palisades in Michigan had recently been shut down. Uh, Pilgrim, yeah, there was, there was three or four of them. Diablo Canyon set that very contentious to uh, keep that one operating. Pickering's another one that we're familiar with here in Ontario that we're trying to keep extended. And just seeing all of these opportunities for nuclear power it could come with Bitcoin mining. I started promoting the idea of we can use this next generation of nuclear power. It's going to be smaller and have more far reaching market advantages, can apply to different uh, heat applications that the standard nuclear power, nuclear reactors don't apply to. But the general idea was basically we want to deploy small nuclear reactors to very far reaching uh, off grid locations that wouldn't be applicable to a large nuclear reactor. But one of the liabilities with doing so is that you may or may not have sufficient demand to capitalize on that power capacity that you have available to you. And that is an economic liability. So it can make investors hesitant to actually get involved with these projects. So I figured if we can have a guaranteed customer like Bitcoin mining to accompany these nuclear reactors when they're deployed into their own microgrid scenarios, that would uh, ensure a guaranteed demand source to util fully utilize the reactor asset from the moment that it's operational until the moment that it's decommissioned. And the modularity of how Bitcoin mining can be used, it can be used flexibly in day to day. and they can be peeled off as the local community evolves and sold on various marketplaces that are now starting to evolve and becoming more robust like hatch rate index uh, yeah luxor's mine one and then there's yeah there's a few of them that i'm familiar with at this point but it, yeah it's a very good opportunity for nuclear power to just investigate a new technology that they can accompany with their nuclear reactors to ensure that we can sell this electricity because we have to sell the reactor a sufficient amount of reactors to justify the, the building and the licensing of the designs in the first place. So that requires commitments in advance. And so there's a lot of chicken and egg variables that have to go on in regards to who's going to pay for them, who's going to cite them, are we going to build enough to reduce the marginal cost to even make it worthwhile in the first place. So a lot of people Way, making sure that everybody is on the same page before it seems like we're going to see a, a substantial momentum, but it does seem to be building and I'm trying to be just a small part of that. Yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but uh, we can- No problem. We, we encourage rants on this show. Um, so you kind of uh, briefly mentioned uh, SMRs, small modular reactors. Can you kind of explain what that is, sort of how that differs from a sort of Call it a traditional nuclear nuclear reactor uh, in terms of what it looks like and and I guess the the uh, power capacity of such a place. Yeah, the main difference is size and scale. The traditional large reactors are designed in the like several hundreds of megawatt range, which is adequate for powering a city or large like manufacturing and industrial base. You're not going to be able to build something like that in a location where you only need a few hundred megawatts to, to satisfy a local jurisdiction. So in many cases, yeah, nuclear power has not been able to advance itself in every potential market for, for power. Just big base load that you can put like somewhere like outside of a city like Toronto. We have 12 reactors just outside the city and then another eight a few hours away at the uh, Bruce reactor site. Um, so those are traditionally built large so they can take advantage of scale and the Canadian reactor fleet was built in a serial fashion so that the idea was if you build multiples of the exact same unit of reactor, you can take advantage of the experience building the first one and then, and then the second one and just learn, learn by doing and then just improving the efficiency of building them and lowering the cost per unit. And so that was a, a big sub milestone that Ontario had achieved many years ago by building as many reactors as we did in a very short period of time. And it has 
served us quite well in getting our grid almost basically completely off of coal, but we do still have natural gas to serve as uh, peaking loads in for when it's required, but predominantly Ontario is nuclear in Ontario and, uh, and hydropower. Um, but yes, getting to the smaller reactors, the advantage that they are going to have is that they'll be able to be deployed in a, in a serial fashion, but built and manufactured in a central location and their main components will be configured in such a way that they can be shipped to site on just standard um, transportation methods, just a shipping container or uh, various freighting uh, cargo containers. Um, the smaller ones will be basically delivered to site, completely assembled and ready to be commissioned within a few weeks to six months. And then as they get a bit larger, there'll be several components that need to be assembled, taking maybe as much as two years to completely commission them once they get to site. But they run a range from like the very smallest ones that are being proposed are one megawatt and five megawatt units. And then there's a few in the 60, 80, 100 megawatt range. And then there's others that are up in the 200 to 300 megawatt range. And then they're also going to have a range of different temperature outputs. So the ones that are similar to boiled water reactors that we're familiar with will only operate at the like 300 degrees Celsius to 400 as their maximum range, but some of them that use molten salts and high temperature gases can operate more in the ranges of seven to 800 degrees Celsius, which opens them up for a lot more industrial markets like, like textiles and chemical production. And they can actually like do a petrochemical refining, mineral refining. There's basically anything that, that heat less than a thousand degrees can now Justify, be justified to apply nuclear power to it. Like pharmaceutical companies like Dow are even starting to look into nuclear power that can generate the steam and heat that they need. So the, the game plan is to choose a number of these units in, in a few of the categories, breaking them into like very small and medium, and then a few that are like advanced styles that will be fueled from uh, the recycled and reprocessed fuel from the traditional reactors to, to get more utilization out of that processed fuel. Um, and so the small reactors, and yeah, so they want to have like, they want to choose like two or three in the very, very small category and then mass produce those and then two or three in like the medium and then two or three in the, in the bigger ones. And then that's the idea is that then they'll serialize those and export them to various markets and have made like manufacturing hubs in various like ports like um, New Brunswick wants to use the Bell Lagoon port to demonstrate the ARC clean energies reactor type it's 100 megawatt uh, molten salt reactor so they want to use the port to build the manufacturing site for the reactor they want to power the port with several units of that reactor and then surrounding that they want to build a large clean energy industrial park where they will uh, produce hydrogen, desalinate water, uh, and produce like higher order chemicals and various other industries that want to take advantage of an uh, abundance of nuclear power at that port that it has a very like high quality like export uh, advantage to where it's located. And then they want to do that at several places. Like Canada wants to do it. America has a few locations that they want to do it. Europe um, has a, a few countries that are looking into possibly hosting some of these reactors. I even saw something just yesterday that Rwanda has uh, made a deal with a Canadian company that has a proposed uh, small molten salt reactor that may be able to operate up to as much as 100 degrees Celsius. And they're going to offer to use their expertise to develop that because they, even some of these African countries, like they may not have nuclear power, but many of them do have like uh, medical radiation uh, programs. And so they do have experience and exposure to like radiation standards and, and regulations and many of them are starting to to, to pivot towards power um, so it is very it is exciting to see the enthusiasm for nuclear power in a lot of African nations nowadays and that Rwanda deal I think is just just the beginning of what we're going to see and they're expecting to be able to have an operating reactor in roughly the same timeline as what we're expecting here in Ontario in the late 20s and then it'll be a, a really good hub to deploy it throughout their local region and, and help, yeah, help a lot of their communities that aren't serviced well by a very fractured grid system. We'll 
bring a lot of developments to where it's needed the most. And the, sorry yeah. to interrupt. The the one that you mentioned in New Brunswick and some of the other ones that are say coming to Ontario or other parts of Canada for that matter, uh, those sort of contracts have already been signed and and all of that's under development already. Nothing shovels in the ground. It's all still like licensing and preliminary stuff. I would expect if things go to plan, we'll start to see building commence on at least one, maybe two of them by late 24, maybe early 25. Like we should definitely see some action at the, the Darlington site where they want to build the 300 megawatt uh, miniaturized boil water reactor from GE Hitachi because that's just a smaller version of a uh, of the boil water reactors that our major fleet is already kind of familiar with. So they aren't going to need as much like, new regulation and oversight as some of these newer science and technologies are going to involve. Like, because because we're going to be using new different new coolants and new sizes and new markets and new environments that we might be deploying these reactors to. There's there's going to have to be an evolution of the regulatory environment that, that oversees these things because it's configured for large single unit reactors to just stay in place and, and operate very just day in day out without uh, without much excitement happening so when we have four five six different new reactors on the table we're going to have to yeah establish a new regulatory framework that, that fits them in but also accommodates them in a way that doesn't like stifle the innovation and development so there's there's a lot of work going on on that front right now so I think once once some of that stuff is tied up, it's, it's very time consuming and, and tedious and involves a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy. I, th I think we will start to see a lot more momentum in this space. But in, until then, it's just very slow, gradual grind and crossing various milestones with, with licensing at sites and, and developing partnerships and relationships with, with like, the different provinces that are also looking at nuclear power. because. Uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan aren't, aren't historically nuclear power provinces, but they are also looking to developing nuclear power for their jurisdictions. I think Saskatchewan's known in the nuclear industry for its robust uh, uranium mines up in the north. There's two two very very high quality ore bodies that are up in northern Saskatchewan at the Cigar Lake and the Parker Lake that, that Canada has been blessed with. And from what I understand, there is a lot more up there that's not as high quality as those two, but there is no shortage of uranium to be tapped into should the uh, market incentives uh, push things in that way. And with the price of uranium starting to creep its way up, I would not be surprised if we start seeing more investment, and more exploration in that space. Because we're going to need a lot of it if, uh, if we're going to pull through on some of these plants. I, that's something I've actually thought about over the past few months. Like if I, I don't really own stocks right now, but I thought if I wanted to get into it, like uranium miners would be probably one of the ones I would actually dabble my toes in. Um, I mean, there's all these questions that are kind of like floating around in my head right now. Uh, one that comes to mind is like, how large is a site like the one in Pickering, you know, your, your more traditional nuclear power plant, what's the footprint like? And then how does that compare to, let's say the smallest of the SMRs? Like the physical footprint of the site itself, like 10, 12 acres, and it's okay. generating probably, I think, like Pickering with, they're not all operational, their units, some have definitely been decommissioned permanently, but there's four that they want to keep online for, they to extend their life, but I think it's about, it's definitely more than gigawatts, about maybe like one and a half gigawatts of power and on like, yeah, 10, 10 to maybe 15 acres. And for like regulatory reasons and safety reasons, the the exclusion zone for it, like should there be an event, is is a little bit larger than that. Just although, can do reactors are designed, uh, recognized as one of the safest, as basically the safest reactors designed for the uh, older generation of reactors. So that's uh, definitely something that we have to be proud of. That yeah, are, are we have so many redundancies in those reactors that. They probably couldn't even react with meltdown if uh, somebody tried to make them meltdown. So that is something that should reassure people that live near them. That's good to know. Yeah, and, and sorry to to let you finish answering that question. So how how does uh, like what is the size of a small SMR? The very small ones, like these five megawatt ones, maybe like a, a small block, like like a high school 
footprint, like it track fields. Uh, and then as we get larger, yeah, it's just basically up to the 300 megawatt ones, probably be like an acre, two acres. Wouldn't need, wouldn't need a lot. Like they, they, they would be able to be contained in buildings that, that you wouldn't even recognize what they were if, if you didn't know that they were in operating if they're power plant. Right. Because, because they're not going to have like the same like large steam stacks and they'll have a lot different technology for how they dissipate their heat and, and re recirculate their, their cooling pumps. So it's, they, they're going to be a lot different looking like aesthetically than the traditional reactors we're familiar with. Like I, like there's a lot of cool, like, uh, like art uh, pieces about some of these new reactors, like what they could propose to be look like. And some of them look like, pretty cool and like, who knows what we're going to get, but like the way I understand it, if you just, if you have the core components, like your main core and your, your research, your heat recirculation pumps, and then your turbine, like you know, those are your major components. Like you could, in theory, just contain them in an, a building with an exterior that has whatever aesthetics that you want to match to whatever community and locality you're in. Like if you are in like a community that you want to match it to like some traditional like tribal identity, then you could you could construct the exterior building that, that matches the aesthetics of, of the, the local community. So it's right. We, we could, we could get really creative with these things, but yeah, like, 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 let's first get them built, tested, demonstrate all these safety features. And then once people have a lot more confidence with the technology, then we can start getting, thinking into things about how pretty we want to make them look. But it's, that it, this is an important piece of the puzzle too. Like you don't want these things to like be an eyesore, like, like the that's true. endless fields of solar panels and windows. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, if people don't want to be around these things, uh, there's going to be a big pushback from people that are, you know, living within some of these communities. Um, you know, you'd mentioned how, how safe the, the Canadian nuclear power plants are, which first of all, is amazing to hear. Um, but you know, that, that makes me think like, I know there are misconceptions around this, you know, so-called safety or, um, danger levels of <laughs> nuclear power plants. So what are some of the common misconceptions that you often hear the ones that really sort of drive you bananas? Yeah, it's just that it's yeah, it's treated disproportionately danger more dangerous than than other industries that have like similar like risks associated with them. It's not that hazards are very little like aside from the exposure to radiation, everything else about a nuclear power plant, nuclear research is just a general industrial setting and most of the like injuries and any issues that happen are all related to just everyday industrial issues. Like somebody like pinches their hand or gets cut on glass or, or like bumps themselves and, and trips and yeah, it, or yeah, there's someone like didn't, didn't improperly um, like locked out to like an electrical thing before uh, working on it. Just we make sure that things like that don't happen and they're all learning experiences, but it's all, yeah stuff that would have could happen at any industrial site but there is a lot more a lot more oversight because of the nature of radiation and, and nuclear power so we definitely make sure to take care of safety as a highest priority which also makes it very expensive and yeah one of the other things that's related to that is is the understanding of how dangerous radiation actually is it's it's the yeah the, the linear non-threshold theory is this concept that was conceived back in the 20s that presumed that the hazard of nuclear power of, of being exposed to radiation is cumulatively hazardous if you get lots of small doses that add up to the same amount of exposure as a large dose. And the, the guy that had postulated this theory had, he was radiating fruit flies in his laboratory and he would, it was seeing that it would cause tissue damage and, and cancerous uh, um, damage at very high radiation ranges. But at the time, they didn't have the capabilities of detecting very low radiation ranges. So he wasn't able to, to fill in the bottom left hand of the graph. So he was just drew a straight line from zero to the top right. But more anecdotal research and like in the field research that's been come out is showing that, that small doses of radiation actually kind of forms more of a uh, of a j curve that small dose of radiation not only is not harmful until you 
reach like a, a really high threshold, but small doses is actually, um, your, your body actually responds to it similar to how you would repair muscle, mus muscle tissue damage when you do exercise. It's just, it, it causes a small amount of damage and your body is capable, has the experience to repair that tissue damage and then actually make it more robust from future exposures. So until you reach like really high thresholds, like radiation exposure is actually quite uh, innocuous is we get exposed to it every every day. Bananas have potassium 40 in them. Uh, flying has a higher uh, exposure to radiation. Most medical diagnostic procedures have exposure to radiation. There's places on the planet where people will actually go that have a higher background uh, radiation than this, the set standard for what nuclear energy workers are even allowed to get exposed to. Like there's, there's a beach in Brazil where if you spent many hours there, you would get exposed to roughly the same amount of radiation as, as like the average nuclear power worker does in a year. So it's, it's very interesting just the, the history of, of radiation and our response and reaction to it and our understanding of it has, has been evolving over the last few decades, but some misunderstandings about it got instantiated in policy many decades ago. And then that has, has created like, like a, basically a safety arms race where it's always just, there's always a new safety obstacle that needs to be overcome. And it, and it, at the point it just becomes, it can become overly bureaucratic and it stifles innovation and it makes it difficult for the move, the industry to move forward because lots of bureaucracy means very slow moving. So it's, yeah, for sure. And I'm curious, like, what do you think is the reason for that? Like, why is there this huge sort of knowledge gap? Why is there this common narrative that nuclear is just this dangerous thing when in reality, it's probably the safest of all energy sectors? It is a complex thing that most people aren't, don't get like education on unless you go to a university for like a science program, like you, most people don't even get exposed to any education about nuclear at all. Like, I remember at high school, there was like a short lesson about how uh, like nuclear fission worked and just how uranium broke apart and just the, the, the little basics about that and the different alpha, beta and gamma particles that are emitted when, when radiation, when a radioactive particle decays. Um, and pop culture is definitely another one that can add to that because uh, Simpsons was definitely not the best portrayal of nuclear power and, and how yeah uh, it's managed. Mr. Burns is, is not representative of the typical owner of a nuclear power plant, although you would, wouldn't uh, be able to guess that if you listen to the sort of rhetoric that comes out of the anti-nuclear people these days. Um, yeah, they, and there's there was also like a movie, the China Syndrome movie came out just before Three Mile Island happened, so it, it overly sensationalized the incident and it was actually quite con contained and did not really lead to that like very many exposures and nobody actually there were actually no fatalities related to that one event and, and then it was Sorry, just, rel related to three mile island you mean yeah yeah okay. was, yeah i was gonna was, i was gonna ask you about that actually so nobody died in that incident no there was definitely people that got higher than your their their allowable like regulatory the exposure to radiation, but from what the records have been showing is that there hasn't been any like, heightened uh, like uh, tissue issues and cancerous issues associated with that. Although, like some people claim there are, but it's 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 so close to the baseline that it's hard to tell than any signal from the noise because yeah, there's it was it wasn't a significant event, and it, and, and the problem with that is because of how these events were portrayed, it does attach like, an emotional capacity to it where we're like I, I, you, you, it is a tragic event and there's empathy for the people that are involved in all of these events but because of the way that we misunderstand it we overreact to it and the reactions to it actually may have like, like caused more of panic and more more issues than the actual events themselves so it's mm -hmm. it's it's a very contentious topic because yeah, people, people have emotional attachment, especially if you were involved in these events. And and yeah, I don't don't mean to feel to to be insensitive, but yeah, sometimes I can just kind of go by by the numbers and just be very rational about it and, and not uh, associate with like the, the emotional aspect of these. So I try 
try to at least present that angle that that there is more to it than just like the the event the event happened and then there was reaction to the event and then there's how people respond to the event but the problem with it is yeah the, the misunderstandings carry forward and then it, it does make it hard for us to come back and revisit like every 10 years there seems to be a resurgence of nuclear power like we're seeing it in the early 2000s before Fukushima happened we were set and ready to build dozens and dozens of these generation three reactors basically the type that just got finished at Vogel like there was oh, many many of these planned that all got stifled because the world kind of just moved away from nuclear power for a few years and we were confident that these plans that we had that we could do it with windmills and solar panels because at the time they were becoming cheaper and there was a lot more interest in reducing fossil fuels and that there was periods that were hydrocarbons were, were quite expensive so we were trying to add more to these grids and compensate for it instead of instead of taking that signal and advancing more hydrocarbon uh, exploration and development because we seem to still need it and we still have the demand for it because i still see lots of like, demands the same but if we're not obtaining it from our own uh, like highly like high quality like regulatory re regulated environments like with good labor standards good environmental standards like here in our local jurisdictions we're just importing it from somewhere else that doesn't have high quality like labor standards environmental standards so we would actually have a better impact on emissions if we were if a nation like canada were to actually exploit our resources in a responsible manner like we can because with our plans for the SMRs, we want to deploy those out to like the oil field so that we can use the power and the heat and the steam from the reactors to do the extraction and refining of the oil so that we don't need to use the oil and the gas to perform those functions themselves. And then by displacing as much of the uh, hydrocarbons from power and heat generation as we can, then we can move those to higher order uses like using them for fertilizer and higher order as a base um, feedstock for higher order chemicals and various other industrial processes that can use them. And then that will have much more far reaching, far reaching impacts on the quality of our electrical systems and our relationship with hydrocarbons. Cause I don't foresee that just ending anytime soon, mm -hmm. but, uh, if that's the direction we're moving in, like we're going to have, we have a lot more than just like, yeah, energy and transportation to, uh, that they're involved in so it's yeah it's, it's, it's going true to be a, i think it's going to be a weird breakup i think people are looking at some of this with just a, sort of a very tunnel vision sort of perspective where i mean they're just specifically looking at cars and going okay if we can if we can tackle that all of our energy worries are, are or not energy but environmental concerns are, are you know by the wayside right uh i mean first of all people don't think about the fact that evs uh, where does that electricity come from? I mean, in the case of Ontario, like you said, a lot of it is nuclear and it is hydro. So it, it kind of works out, but in places where you're more reliant on natural gas or, or, <clears throat> or just, uh, just oil, um, it doesn't really solve any issues. Does it, <laughs> um, where was I going? I forget where I was going with that, but it's cause I have this other question sort of lingering. Uh, you mentioned Fukushima and correct me if I'm wrong, but nobody died from Fukushima either. Is that correct? I believe on record there may have been one that the the government has ad, like claimed admission that it was associated with exposure to radiation. Okay. That that's that's the, the only one on record that I'm aware of. There's there's anecdotal evidence that that some yeah some people that may have consumed yeah, irradiated material that had uh, contaminated food and some of the uh, milk that was available at the time mm -hmm. may have expose themselves and have some tissue damage associated with that, but they haven't really seen any significant long-term uh, effects and patterns coming out of that. And like, in fact, like the, the zone around that reactor has been shortened to like less than a few hundred meters. There's, you, you can get, they, they take people on tourist uh, visits to uh, come and see the site. So you, and you can see for yourself, like they'll, you'll, they'll give you like radiation measurements you can see how much you're getting exposed to as as you get closer to that. So you have to get awfully close to the open uh, reactor building to even start having the 
significant fields that you would have to start raising concerns about. So, it, so it's actually pretty cool because of the way that nuclear radiation decays. It's just the, the, the most harmful stuff that came out of that reactor when the uh, when the hydrogen explosion happened was uh, the cesium and iodine. But because of their nature, they decay very quickly. And that's what makes them hazardous because they are emitting more radio, radioactive particles at a faster rate. But that also means that they're decaying at a faster rate. So that also means that out after a period of time, there is significantly less of them until there is essentially no more left because they've decayed into a more stable element that, that decays at a slower rate and has a much uh, lower hazard profile. And then it becomes much safer to handle this material. So after like with material like cesium, yeah, after like 10, 12 years, there's almost there's a negligible trace of it in the uh, areas where it had been exposed to. So hmm. that gets into just like the nuclear waste in general, because I, I don't know if you, you may have heard claims that, that we're going to have to store this waste for millions and millions of years, and, and it's never going to go away, but, but it actually does, because that's the nature of radioactive decay. It has a half-life. Just it, it looks exactly the same as the Bitcoin curve, except um, it's disappearing instead of accumulating. It's just an exponential decay. So anybody that's familiar with this Bitcoin and the four-year halving cycle, it's roughly the same for radiological material. And what's really interesting too is it's a completely random process. So when when a like a, a radioactive atom releases its um, like the, the whatever the alpha particle, beta particle. It is a completely random event, which I, th I thought was really cool thinking about how each block on the blockchain is a completely random event. You never know when exactly it's going to be found. You never know who it's going to be found. You don't know how many billions and trillions of, of guesses and hashes it's going to take to find it. it, it it's, it's an interesting parallel that I've, I've, I've recognized recently when I was thinking more about this stuff. Hmm. Um do you know, you mentioned Bitcoin mining using a nuclear power plant. That's kind of the whole premise of this show. Is yeah. is this actually happening already? Because I, I swear I read something not that long ago about it. I'm familiar with three locations that you could say are mining Bitcoin with nuclear power. The first and most obvious one is um, it's a collaboration between Talon Energy that owns the Susquehanna power, nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania. And then the, uh, some the Bitcoin mining companies are terrible and Cumulus Coin. They have come together to build a data center site right behind the meter on within like the the um, contain zone where the reactor is sited. So within the, the, the secured area beyond the uh, the perimeter of the reactor site. So that is very cool development. I think it's 80 megawatts at the moment with uh, plans for expansion up to as much as like 200 megawatts, but that may that may even evolve into something bigger, but that's the first and biggest one. And was also really interesting about that one is the uh, a conference that I attended a few weeks ago for the North American Young Generation in Nuclear. One of the presenters there, uh, his name's Brad Berryman, he was the chief nuclear officer of the Susquehanna Nuclear Power Plant, and he was there specifically to talk about the data center that they built and how that's been going for them and the different strategies that they have associated with it. So he wasn't too adept on the Bitcoin side of things. He was he understands generating and selling power, but he knew the value of having a customer that is incredibly flexible that the Bitcoin miners offer. Um, the second one in America that I'm familiar with is, um, I wouldn't say it's directly with a nuclear power plant, but CleanSpark has a large presence growing on Georgia with their local co-ops. And Georgia, as many people know, that is where the Vogel reactors are that just came online. So yeah, Georgia has a substantial portion of their electrical generation coming from their power. So you could tangentially say that CleanSpark is using a significant portion of the power for their Bitcoin mining operations. And they have uh, definitely have their sights set on expanding quite a bit. I think they said something like 16 exahash by the end of the year is what their goal is. And they are definitely approaching that and have a pretty steady pace getting there. And then the other very interesting one is in Abu Dhabi where the United Arab Emirates just completed four large nuclear reactors that they built in collaboration with uh, South Korea. 
there's I think 5.2 gigawatts is their total capacity each unit. Yeah, it's 1.4 gigawatts for each unit. Um, they're already talking about building another two in the not too distant future. And so once you've built four and you already have the expertise and capabilities to build four, why not build more? And then there's also talks about helping uh, many of their neighboring states achieve similar 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 accomplishments with uh, their power infrastructure. And seen. those ones are for Bitcoin mining? They're not specifically for Bitcoin mining, but Marathon Digital Holdings has, uh, yeah, they they have a collaboration going on with a sovereign wealth fund in Abu Dhabi to build a large Bitcoin mining data center that's predominantly going to be powered with those nuclear reactors. It's, it's very close that it's probably within like one or two substations away. So they're primarily going to be um, uh, operating off of the excess generation that that power plant is going to be having when uh, they have lower demands during their, their cooler months. They, like everywhere else, they have during the, the temperature cycles from month, from season to season. So you get, if you have more cooling than in your, your cooling extreme than you would on your heating extreme, then you're gonna have more power draw. It's like up here in Canada, especially in like places like Quebec, where they use uh, a lot of electrical heating, you can see their electrical usage spike significantly in the winter. And then that also limits the amount of power that they can export, which, which is one of the reasons why Quebec is even now talking about renewing the Gentilly reactor that was shut down and uh, set up for decommissioning 10 years ago or so. And yeah, there was no expectation that that was ever going to be revived, but now there's actually serious talk about dividing power in Quebec. So that's a pretty cool development. And yeah, so that was the three major um, nuclear power Bitcoin mining relationships that I'm familiar with. Um, so Justin Orkney, I don't know if you're familiar with him, the audience may or may not be, but he's a, uh, he's formerly of Duke power. He, he was their, their late, their, um, basically their demand response guy. He was the guy to figure out how to make all these systems work together and cooperate with, with controllable loads and, and variable generation. And he picked up on Bitcoin mining and now he's working with a Bitcoin mining company in Ohio that's apparently building a large data center and they have plans for the Beaver Valley reactor that, that's uh, near the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania. So that's another one for people to keep an eye on that we'll probably start hearing more about in the next few quarters. But it's definitely cool to see happening. And it's, they're good. By the time we start getting into the SMRs, we'll have like several more like different strategies and business models and ways that it can be configured and that we can see whether whether we want to go with like a a model where we're partnering with with a generator and a Bitcoin miner as two separate entities, or if they become one entity where possibly like a power generator will just buy something like a hash hut from upstream data and then just operate it uh, on their own like that. Or who knows, like maybe one of these big companies that uh, actually builds these nuclear reactors may want to have a Bitcoin mining division that actually like studies and builds like custom made integrated units that come with a reactor and a contingency of Bitcoin mining just right sized, perfectly planned for whatever community it's being deployed to. Like, we could probably already be doing that with some of the guys that have uh, pretty high level of sophistication building these things, like the guys with uh, from Grid and Lancium and Riot and uh, the Barefoot mining. There's there's countless of them out there that would have uh, pretty interesting strategies with how they would site a nuclear reactor and uh, made it up and match it perfectly to how the community would want to evolve. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these guys are just like, just give me a nuclear reactor, give me my Bitcoin miners. Just give me a, a, a chunk of land that I can build my own community and then we're gonna have we're, we're gonna have an, an interesting um, arms race of citadels popping up that are powered by little nuclear SMRs. It's interesting you say that because like in my head the wheels are turning and I'm I'm kind of thinking about the game theory. That for me is like one of the most interesting things about Bitcoin is like how's this whole thing gonna play out? Uh, nationally, sort of globally, you know, who are the first movers and what sort of advantages are they going to have? And so I, I can just envision, you know, politicians and, and people in, in business that are sort of trying to tie up these loose ends, get these contracts set up because, um, I mean, I, I could certainly see a future in it. Um, obviously, nuclear, it's providing 
clean energy, but it's also providing cheap energy. I, I had Lisa Huff on uh, recently. Uh, that episode hasn't aired yet, but she was telling me in the States, the average price for energy is, I think it was 17 US cents per kilowatt hour. So like, what would, let's say this, if you have any idea, the, the place in Pennsylvania you mentioned, do you know what the energy cost would be coming out of there? I don't know what their general wholesale prices are, but I know what the the Bitcoin mining data center is working with two or three cents a kilowatt hour, which is incredibly low. Wow. So they're they are set up quite well for the foreseeable future with a with a uh, a price contract like that. So I think that's for at least four or five years. So they're just going to hold on to that and expand it probably out to its maximum capacity to take full advantage of it. And then they'll probably find a way to provide other services to the grid. Like we're seeing all the demand response and ancillary um, things that are happening in Texas, just selling power back to the grid. If you own a contract and if your wholesale, your spot prices exceed your break even point, it's an easy decision to turn off your operation and make more money selling it to the grid. And, and I find it funny that all of these uh, naysayers have come out of the woodwork recently hating on the fact that Riot has been making a ton of money by selling power contracts, but like that's that's the nature of the business that they run. They, they own power contracts. They are free to do whatever they want with those power contracts. It's like, how dare they... They stop, they turn off their machines before they would reach a, a limit that they get penalized for. It's like, well... Well, if they're going to get penalized for operating past this limit, well, then of course they're going to turn off their machines. They're not stupid. They're they're businessmen. They're trying to make money. They're trying to benefit the Bitcoin mining network. And they're also trying to benefit your damn grid by making it cheaper to provide these demand response services. Because if they weren't there, then you'd have to kick on your peaker plant sooner. And they're not always the, the highest cost on your stack. So it's like... I think that's point. the piece that's missing that people just aren't aware of. Because uh, that's that's an important one to mention, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people are either ignorant of that or they've forgotten that. And I think I'm glad you highlighted that. A lot of people know nothing about where their electricity comes from. They just, they, the lights turn on and they don't think about it until the lights don't come on when they hit that switch. That's, that's when people start asking questions. And, and even now we're starting to see these scenarios where they're trying to get comfortable with people, where get people comfortable with having your power curtailed for three different times of the day. And it's one thing for that to be voluntary and you're just like, okay, there's strain on the grid. We would ask that you don't have your AC on full blast while you're cooking and drying clothes and have every other device on your house out. You know, at least be conscious. Like, like that's one thing to just be a little bit more energy conscious at the times when everybody else is here to power. But it's another thing when, when it looks like they want to start like just having command over people's appliances and power usage. It, like voluntary becomes... It voluntary and scheduled becomes involuntary and scheduled very quickly. And then before we know it, it becomes involuntary and unscheduled. That's when things start to really go sideways. And we start to see the scenes really start to, to fray in this very fragile uh, civilization we find ourselves in. Like people do not understand the miracle it is that power is delivered to their homes the way and the, the, in the reliable way that it is. So... Mm -hmm. It is provoking a lot more people to start asking these questions and taking a lot more interest in this topic because it's very fucking important, especially when you see nations like Lebanon and South Africa that were at one point, they had robust grids. They did not routinely have blackouts. And now they do. Now there's periods of times like that you have to actually actively manage your electricity usage and, and plan when to, to charge your phone, plan when the kids can do their homework, plan when you can clean clothes. You have to have backups and generators to make sure that you can keep your your fridge cold, and it has and it just has all these second order and third order effects that you don't really consider until you actually find yourself in these environments because people do unpredictable and crazy things when they're really pushed to uh, straining breaking points, and I really don't want to see anything like that come to America or Canada right now, especially with how divided and contentious our politics and social cohesion is at the moment. I would, I would much rather us not have to fight over scarce resources like electricity. I would rather it just be so abundant that, uh, that we don't get pitted into that uh, chaotic scenario that uh, 
could await us if we really wreck up the place in an unfortunate way that we can't recover from. Because it's it, once once you start sliding down that hill, it, it it is not easy to recover. So I hope yeah, we don't. Yeah, uh, I'm with you on that. I mean, I agree. With there, there's been so much political divide within Canada in the states, really, <clears throat> probably all over the world. And so I I hear you, and I I don't want to see us going down that path either. Um, these these hubs, if you will, right? These mining hubs. Uh, you refer to them like through our correspondence as uh, sort of major nodes. Um, how how does that shape sort of the future? Like, what does the economy look like if the world, or let's just say Canada for that matter, um, has these sort of pockets of SMRs that are dedicated to Bitcoin mining? What does that do to, to society? Well, like, let's assume that, that things progress how we're kind of predicting that, that, that usage and and the, the value of Bitcoin is just going to continue to grow, the scarce asset. We all know the value proposition, the more people use it, the better it gets, the more, yeah, the more people are mining and it goes through that virtuous cycle that I think is somewhere in the, in the somewhere in the Gradually and Suddenly series. I, I uh, Parker has a really good uh, piece on that. But um, yeah, if we continue going down that path and then we start having our electrical generation as these nodes that are also might not not only generating power and then distributing that through the electrical system because if you really just think about it the electrical system is just nodes and channels and then they they deliver it from a generator to an end user so you've got your, your generator and then your, your, your poles and your your lines and then your substations and that gets it to everyone it's actually remarkably similar to like the architecture of how like the lightning network fits together it's just the electrical system is basically just liquidity management for electrons. And we're, we're seeing that a similar network build on the lightning network. And that is, it is, it is cool that it is called lightning. And, and it does similarly match the flow of electrons on, on electrical grid, except the, the major difference is in lightning, they're static in those channels before that they're, they're told to move and you, you have to instruct them to move rather than on the electrical system they're constantly in motion and they have they're, they're as they're being produced they're being consumed and it's it's a very delicate ballet that has to be balanced at a very specific frequency and if you start generating too quickly you can disrupt the grid if you generate too slow that can be disrupted the grid and there's all kinds of fail safes to ensure that that doesn't happen but it would be interesting to see in the future you start seeing bitcoin the, the generators are now mining bitcoin and then we start incorporating other technologies like um, Sonoda is another interesting one that's being talked about in the Bitcoin space. What they're proposing is to be able to pay real-time settlements to your utilities. So similar to how an application, like a podcasting application like a Fountain, like the value for value, where you can stream sets to a podcaster in real time, Sonoda is crafting a product that will enable um, end consumers to pay for their electricity in basically the same way. So that every for every like 10 kilowatts that you consume, you stream 50 sats back and then you're you're settled in real time for your electricity payments and there's no cool. like invoicing and, and deferred payments. So then that will be like another way that electrical generation infrastructure will actually be able to start earning Bitcoin on top of just mining for it. And the other cool thing about the way that uh, lightning payments work is they can be split among multiple parties. So not only would the consumer be able to pay for the direct, like the, the most direct uh, party that they interact with. Because most of the time consumers are just interacting with like a local co-op and that's who they pay. And then the local co-op pays the generator and pays and like, and then everybody gets like this deferred payments down the line over time. And, and you have to actually wait until the end consumer pays it, which often is like one or two months after they've actually consumed the electricity. But now we're on the verge of having a technology where that can just be done in real time and then split right through the entire value chain, right back to the generator. And in, in theory, you could have like, yeah, like the utilities that, that operate the poles and the wires could have that same similar relationship where in how they buy the electricity from the generator. Cause that's one of the structures that that's kind of typical now is that there'll, there'll be multiple entities, you know, your generators and then your distributors and then your, your consumers as, as independent parties. And then some of them that are more heavily regulated, the generators and the distributors is just one entity, depending on how that particular environment is regulated. But it would be interesting to, just to see 
how lightning can integrate with this value chain in spaces. So as electrons are coming one way to the consumer, sats are going the opposite way to the generator. And so now they're starting another pool of Bitcoin. And then, and then you start thinking, okay, now we've got power generators that are now holding treasuries Bitcoin because they're mining it, they're, they're earning it just from being paid for their electricity. And then what do you do with it? Like we're starting to see things like, well, you could just, you could just be a lightning channel liquidity provider and you could open up channels that enable just commerce to just happen and flow through your channels. And then you can collect your fee on that. And then it could actually like start putting their sets to work in another way. And then on top of that, if, if you have a local community, we're starting to see this idea of the, the fediments and like kind of community banking networks built on, on a Bitcoin ecosystem where you could have like a, a, a mint that is for just the company or just the community, or you can have them even like possibly layered inside of each other. Like some of the ways that I've been hearing different strategies for how fediments can be customized to in, interact with each other and be layered amongst each other is, is quite fascinating. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how a lot of this plays out because the, the people that have tested like the early versions of it sound like they're, they're very impressed with its uh, capabilities and functionality. So. So that'll be another cool one where we're now like you, you potentially have your generating station can essentially be the central hub of that mint. It becomes like a liquidity provider for the entire community and it's essentially just becomes and performs the function of a bank almost. Mm -hmm. like we could That's start seeing, yeah, yeah, like, like, they, like our power generation assets would essentially be the hubs in a major like financial the infrastructure be fascinating to, to see how that could start interacting with each other and it finally pulls together the that idea of the energy money that was proposed by like tesla and ford and uh, buckminster fuller like many many decades ago and then we were basically that would be that would be it that would be the fulfillment of that vision hmm. and then what we do from there who knows that's uh, i'd say we're pretty hyper bitcoinized by that point yeah, I think so too. Like I'm, I don't know how far away this is, but I mean, like it all makes sense, right? To, like it, it seems like common sense. It's all logical. It seems like that's the path we're sort of destined to reach. I have no idea what the timeline is, but like that sounds like a pretty cool future. Um, and it's it's not that um, it's not that these energy producers become banks in I guess modern terms, in that like you know they're the ones custodying people's funds. They're just like you said. They're they're providing liquidity, helping essentially, essentially facilitate financial tr transactions. But seeing that that change, I think, would be pretty cool. Uh, knowing that if I'm using electricity, I don't have to wait three four weeks to get my bill, and then go, oh crap, it's way more than I thought it was. It's just coming out steadily. And if I realize I'm paying too much, like okay, I'm maybe I'm not going to use my air conditioning quite as much, or I'm going to tone down some of my usage. Um, being able to pay on the fly, I think, would be really really cool. That, yeah, you 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 gotta think about how that would affect people's behaviors. Like it's one thing when you're consuming something that you're not that your payments are deferred to, to months out. Like you you don't think about it as much in the moment. But if you if you were seeing that ticker going and your 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 sats flowing out and you're just like then you then you'd be running around the house turning the lights off all the time. Like you you'd be a lot more conscious of that. Making sure that your appliances aren't being overused. You might even like set up like timers on on your hot water tanks or or do the crazy thing that those Bitcoin miners start tempted to do and buy a bunch of ASICs and, and heat our water with ASICs and regulate to our HVAC and wherever else we can find to, to reduce that heat so we can all be a part of this uh, grand adventure of building the Bitcoin network. It's, it's a lot of fun. Like I got one behind me. He's not on right now because it's too hot, and, but he's a space heater in the winter. I've got nice. two in the other room that I just I pumped through the dryer because uh, I don't know how it happened, but I blew up the heating element and I was like, well, I'm not going to replace the heating element. I have a bunch of S9s stacked around. So I just printed off a nice little shroud and ducted them into the back of the dryer. And what's convenient about it is that I'm not pumping out heat into the house because the dryer's already got an exhaust to go outside. So I just, if I want the heat in the house, I open the door. If I want the heat out, close the door. And then in Ontario, because we have price uh, time of use pricing, I will turn them off during the day so I'm not exposing them to 18 cents kilowatt hour. I'll at least try to average my electricity down something around like yeah, 10, 11 cents. Definitely not breaking even, but making use of the heat brings it a little closer. And 
I yeah, also you're stacking, don't, you know, KYC yeah. free stats. I also don't care. I don't have, I don't really have any overhead. So it's like, I can, I, I can make enough for my day to day job that I can pay the, the excess and knowing that in the future, those stats will hopefully be worth a lot more, but I may have timed it poorly because they were still fairly high and yeah, we'll, we'll see if they can break themselves. Even Might've been, might've been worth it to either just buy more Bitcoin at the time, but we learned from our mistakes. I know now I should be buying. Uh, sorry. I just, one thing I want to um, <clears throat> get to before we, uh, before we wrap up. Um, and, and I'm not sure how much you know about this, but I've, I've heard about this thing called thorium, which apparently is like this better alternative to uranium. Are you familiar with that? Thorium is definitely very abundant and there okay. is a significant amount of it. It has a slightly different, it has a different way that needs to be processed because thorium isn't naturally fissile. There's, there's no isotopes of thorium that are fissile. So what has to happen is it has to be exposed to a, a neutron environment in order to um, basically convert it into a usable form that is then fissile, that then can be fuel in a nuclear reactor. So it's so it does it has a few more processing steps than uranium. So we may we we will very likely see thorium reactors in the future, but like at the moment, it is just still way easier to use uranium. Like especially for the Canadian reactors, we don't even need to enrich it. We we use the the uranium, the raw uranium, straight out of the ground, it just gets refined into the usable pellets, and then we pop it into the reactor, and, and then she generates electricity for us. And, but then, yeah, the American fleet and most of the other world, because they use light water, they need uh, more enriched, yeah, more enriched uranium for their fuel. They, uh, okay, so when you say enriched, uh, that means essentially adding minerals to the water. No, what that is is. Um, Natural uranium, it has two primary isotopes of uranium. There's uranium-238 and uranium-235. And so those two numbers are basically represent the, the, the sum total of the neutrons and the protons in the uranium atom. And so the protons being always the same, no matter what, because that's what makes it uranium. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uranium at a different amount of protons. Um, the, the difference in numbers comes from the difference of protons. So it basically means that uranium-238 has three more neutrons than U U-235. And there's a few other isotopes, but those are the primary ones. So when we find uranium naturally in the environment, it's about 99% uranium-238 and 1% uranium-235. So that's, that's the enrichment level that gets put into the Canadian reactors. And for most of the, uh, the typical fleet, requires anywhere from three to 5% enrichment. So what that means is they're just, they're increasing the amount of uranium-235 in that mix because 235 is the one that is fissile. Uranium-238 is not fissile at all. So it's, it's actually useful and it, it gets in the way of, of producing energy. So there's different grades of, uh, of enrichment that we have. So, so yeah, three to five is for typical fleet. And then you start getting up into ones that start using like that 20% enrichment. And then when you start getting up into like the 80, 90% enrichment, that's where you get into like the submarine fuel and potentially uh, nuclear weapons fuel. So that's that's the stuff that that's very highly classified and secretive and difficult to get one's, uh, one's hands on because it's incredibly regulated and there's a, a lot of oversight on that, that sort of material. But it, it is also very abundant and it, it uranium in around the world so we're not going to have any shortage of it anytime soon because we can even extract it out of seawater if we were really determined to get more of it fascinating stuff man this this is really cool i'm gonna to have to do some reading because i want to learn more about this uh if people want to find out more about you and sort of things that you're getting involved in where can they look yeah yeah you can check on x i'm a nuclear bitcoiner i post positive things about nuclear power and i will argue with the wind and solar advocates that, that hate nuclear power for some odd reason, yet still still want to save the world from an impending apocalypse of the, yeah, of the climate and caused by carbon. If they, I, yeah, The way I see it, if they don't see nuclear power as part of the role, I, I don't know how to take these people seriously. But yeah, anyways, I argue with them a lot on Twitter. And I'm um, also on Noster, Orange Collab. Those are the ones that are primarily used for communication and messaging people. I'm going to be appearing at the African Bitcoin conference in December, which is pretty cool. cool. I 
ask if they wanted to speak about nuclear power. And the African uh, people are very enthusiastic about Bitcoin and nuclear power these days. So uh, why not capitalize on some of that momentum and possibly even uh, bring an opportunity to get more Western markets into into the uh, Africa area that's predominantly seems to be occupied by China and Russia these days. So there's a lot of lot of oh, opportunity man. for nuclear power in Africa. I'm very awesome. excited for it. Have you ever been? No, no, I had never left Ontario. In, well, except for a few ventures out to Quebec, until I was invited by Peter McCormick, and he flew me to uh, to Bedford, which was really cool. And then, yeah, that year I went to Bedford, El Salvador, Japan, and then this year I've been to Minneapolis and hoping to go to Accra, Ghana, in a few months. So it's a awesome. whirlwind adventure. I had no expectation that this was going to happen. I just I just found a really good idea, and I just started really just just poking at it constantly, and. Uh, yeah, here I am talking to cool people on the internet about a really big idea, and everybody seems very enthusiastic about it. Like I got to speak with Safe Dean and Marty Bent just a few like days ago, a few weeks ago. So that's pretty cool. It sounds so, like guys, uh, hyper yeah. Bitcoinization is on the way, and you are one of the people at the forefront. So that that's, I mean, that's pretty awesome. Man. <laughs> just just one of the clubs, just like everyone else. But I just I found found my niche, and yeah, I'm working it. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to have you on again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care.